Okay, good morning and uh, well, welcome to the third lecture. This is the last lecture of my uh, mini course on the connections between the dense matter physics, uh, statistical mechanics, critical phenomena, and uh, fluid mechanics. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to uh, just do one leftover from uh, yesterday that I didn't get to mention and I, and I think it's important, so I'm going to spend uh, two minutes on that. And then I'm going to talk about, at the beginning, I'm going to talk about exotic turbulence. So I'm going to talk about possible realization of turbulence in uh, systems that you may not think of as being relevant to our hydrodynamics. And then I'm going to spend uh, most of today's lecture talking about uh, a new work that we've been doing on the connections between uh, the statistical theories of turbulence, uh, phase transitions, critical phenomena, statistical mechanics, and experimental data, particularly with regard to uh, pipe flow in three dimensions, and with regard <coughs> to <coughs> turbulence in two dimensions with soap flows. And let me give some water, excuse me. So the thing that I want to um, uh, uh, briefly uh, start with is something called the dissipation anomaly. Now, in the uh, first lecture, the one on the, on the boundary layers and, uh, and linear ensemble flow, we talked about the important principle that small does not mean negligible, and I introduced you to the notions of intermediate asymptotics of the uh, first kind and intermediate asymptotics of the second kind. And I want to just make now a connection between uh, those ideas and an uh, turbulence. So what I'm going to tell you about is the following. Let's ask the following question. So at uh, what scales uh, does this depicted when is dissipation important? And we discussed that already yesterday, but let's just uh, remind ourselves of how we approach that. I'm going to do it in a slightly different twist to what I presented yesterday. So what we would say is, well, if I think about uh, dissipation, so my navier stokes equations uh, become just balancing the, uh, the, uh, the time derivative with the, uh, the viscous term. So in a way, the, uh, the non-linearities, uh, that's going to give me an estimate that looks like something like this. <laughs> One over tau goes something like mu k squared in, in, the, in k squares. On the other hand, I showed you yesterday that in the inertial range, that uh, tau, at a, for any uh, wave number k, a scale like epsilon to the minus one third, k to the minus two thirds. And uh, the Kolmogorov scale, is the scale at which tau k and tau nu are the same, so the uh, turnover times are the same, and that then gave me the result that eta k is a new cubed of epsilon to the one quarter. So now let's work out, and this is something I didn't do yesterday, what is the mean rate of uh, energy dissipation? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the following estimate. So E dot is basically, I'm going to look at the integral over the volume of the system, and then nu times uh, nu times del squared u, and then uh, multiply by the velocity to get the, the dissipation rate integral over the system. And we can estimate that in the following way. That's basically nu k squared u k squared, where this k wave number is 2 pi over the Kolmogorov scale. And then that is nu k squared epsilon to the 2 thirds over k to the 2 thirds, all evaluated at k is 2 pi over the Kolmogorov scale, and that is just epsilon itself. So that's exactly what we uh, expected. That's what, how, we, uh, how we came to the notion that we should have a cascade where we have a, a steady flow of energy from the top scales to the bottom scales and actually dissipates with this molecular uh, viscosity. So the point about this estimate is that this is independent of viscosity. And why is that surprising? So what that says is, uh, if I take the Navier-Stokes equations, and they're a function of the viscosity, that's nu, and now I take the limit 
as this is going towards zero, so we're reducing the viscosity, according to this calculation here, this estimate is still going to be good. As long as the viscosity is arbitrarily small but non-zero, I will still have the mean dissipation rate going as outsource. On the other hand, if I set mu equals zero in the navier stokes equations, so that just throws away this viscous term here, and what I get is du by dt plus equal grad u is minus grad p. I just get the Euler equations. So we can call the Euler equations the navier stokes equations with mu equals zero, and in those equations, we know, uh, hopefully, this is something that we did with Michael Brenner, that the Euler equations, they just, they just uh, follow just directly from f equals m a. They're just a continuing fluid version of f equals m a. And so what that means is that they're Hamiltonian, the energy is conserved, and so there is no, uh, there is, there is no uh, dissipation rate at all. So these are Hamiltonian. <coughs> And therefore, there is no dissipation. So what that says then is that uh, we have a situation of intermediate asymptotics of the second kind, or a situation where you have a singular perturbation. So if you say that the limit of mu tends to zero, and then the Stokes equation of mu is not the same thing as the Navier Stokes equations with nu equals zero. So this is an example then of intermediate asymptotics of the second kind. That we talked about on last Friday. And this is the reason why turbulence is such a hard problem. Because you can't understand the problem of turbulence by simply looking at uh, the oil equations. This limit is a very subtle and singular, <coughs> singular limit. What other comment to make about this? So I talked uh, on uh, last week about singular perturbations. And we talked about how you have a small perturbation, a small parameter, and the parameter being small is not the same as it being negligible. And you can see uh, why this is also an example of singular perturbations. And here's why. Here's why, when nu is non-zero, you get the navier stokes equation of nu equals zero, that's just the Euler equations, and then you get the term nu del squared u. So the nu comes in in, uh, in multiplying the derivative del squared u. So the nu comes in multiplying this term here, and this term here is the highest spatial derivative in the Navier-Stokes equations. So here you've got du by dt plus u dot grad u, grad p, and then you've got this. So this is the highest spatial derivative And because it's the highest spatial derivative, it means that including this term means that you need more boundary conditions. So here, we only needed, say, first order boundary conditions here now, I've got a second order term, so now I need higher boundary conditions. So that means I need new or extra boundary conditions. And so something, something very deep and structural has happened to the Navier Stokes equations simply by adding the viscosity. Alright, so that thing is this, this whole thing. The fact that even as I take the limit new terms to zero, I still have a finite dissipation rate. <coughs> that does a thing that's called the dissipation anomaly, and in fact it's even related to anomalies that you get in the in quantum field theory and, and, and other areas. Okay. One question, yes? So does that mean that if I have if I add some higher order term, say gradient fourth term yes. in the Navier Stokes equation, that is also similar? It, 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 it could be, it doesn't have to be. But that would also require more boundary conditions. It could, it could be, and whether or, not it makes, whether or not it makes a qualitative change to the equation or not is something that you have to look for. Okay? So, uh, um, 
So it, it, it's often, but not always, a signature of singular perturbations. Okay? And people do that. They use hyperviscosity to try to uh, make uh, the navier stokes equations more suitable uh, to use on computers. Okay, so um, I'm going to now talk to you about um, exotic states of turbulence. So can I put the, the blackboard up and turn off the, uh, the overhead screen, please? So you've seen this. Uh, this is a picture of a two-dimensional <coughs> soap film. And it shows you turbulence and that. We're going to come back to that in about 15 minutes. For now, we're going to need to use uh, the blackboard. Thank you. Okay, so the next topic I want to discuss is what I call exotic turbulence. So, what my goal is. <coughs> This, uh, this section is I want to uh, argue that uh, there's new states of matter uh, may have uh, a very small viscosity and that suggests that you might be able to achieve turbulence in a novel uh, context. In a novel context that I'm going to be thinking of, uh, there, there are actually a number of them. Uh, I'm going to talk about two today. Uh, so one of these topics is the quark gluon plasma. Quark gluon plasma in the relativistic heavy ion collide at Brookhaven. Another of these uh, contexts is a graphene in solid state physics. And another context is in cold atoms. <coughs> So I want to explain to you uh, how one can achieve uh, turbulence in, in these systems. So uh, the idea, the basic idea, is the following. If you think about the Reynolds number, so that's UL in my viscosity nu, and uh, the, the usual way that we try to get uh, high Reynolds numbers, say in a, in a fluid mechanics lab, is that we make u large or we make l large. And usually if you're dealing with air or you're dealing with uh, water, you're stuck with the, uh, what the viscosity is, what nature gives you, and there's nothing much you can do. So that's the usual idea. So, so here, the idea is that we're actually going to send nu to zero. And we're going to send nu to zero by asking how small is it possible to make uh, the viscosity of a fluid. So the question is, how small can nu be? And we're going to ask this question uh, in a very sort of fundamental sounding way. So we're going to ask what is the what limitations arise from uh, fundamentals and from quantum mechanics. So that's, the, that's what I'm going to explain to you. So uh, this is a, a subject that is very new. It's, it's um, still controversial. The, uh, the probability that it's complete nonsense is um, <laughs> somewhat higher than the probability that the other things I've told you are complete nonsense. <laughs> and and it's still, it's still, this probability is still comparable and it's the probability that anything you've heard about Tim, which is completely nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, but anyway, so, so in, order, in, order not to, uh, in order not to make uh, the ratio of um, sort of likelihood of proof to, to BS factor be, be too high, uh, I'm going to present this in a very low level way. So, so if, if uh, Dan Song from uh, the Institute of Nuclear Theory in Washington was here, he give you an explanation of this based on uh, string theory. Actually, he's too good a physicist to do that. If you say that explanation, I'm going to do it. But, uh, but uh, that's where, really where these ideas came from. So I'm just going to show you using very simple kinetic theory estimates that there are fundamental limitations, or possibly fundamental limitations, on, uh, on new, and therefore the new ways to achieve a uh, high level OK, so, so let's remember um, what the viscosity is. So what we mean by viscosity is the following. We take uh, some plates of cross-sectional area A. We shear the system like this with some force F, where we shear 
we create some kind of velocity gradient. So I have u in the x direction as a function of y. So there's x and there's y. And then we define that f is, is proportional to dux by dy, normalized by the area. And of course, it's proportional to higher order terms, but we're going to work within the regime of linear response theory. And then we're going to call the constant of uh, proportionality here the initial uh, viscosity. OK, so the, um, the uh, viscosity gives rise to dissipation, usually. And so you might think that the best fluid have the smallest viscosity. So let's see how we could, how we could try to estimate what the viscosity is. Now, back on your mother's knee, you learned about the kinetic field of gases. <laughs> And what you learned there was you just considered particles bouncing around in a box, crashing into each other, and you did very simple estimates from, uh, from thinking about that, about what the viscosity was, and what you would have found was that, that eta is one third, um, eta is one third uh, times the number density, times the average momentum, times the mean free pump. So this is number density. And this L is mean free part. Okay, and uh, what this uh, this uh, this um, this means is uh, is how likely it is that the particles are going to crash into each other. So, if you want to ask what what can, what governs the mean free path, you have to ask how likely is it for particles in the box to crash into each other. So. How far particles travel before arriving is going to depend upon uh, several things. First of all, it's going to depend upon their cross section. And it's also going to depend upon the density. The number density n. Yeah. So what you would expect is this, that uh, as sigma goes up, so the cross section of the particles goes up, you would expect that L is going to go down. And similarly, you would expect that as the number density goes up, the mean free path is going to go down. And so it won't surprise you that if you go and uh, work it out in, in uh, kinetic theory, that what you get is L is 1 over n sigma. And sigma, of course, is, is, a, is a sort of picture of what a particle collision is, as if there are billiard balls. But in reality, what it is, is some measure of the strength of interactions between uh, the particles. So let's have a look at what that means. So let's suppose that uh, we estimate the momentum. So we say half m p squared, so half p squared over m, that goes like p d t. So that then tells us that we'd expect that p is roughly going to scale as the square root of temperature. And so what we would expect then is that eta increases weekly with temperature. That's the first thing that we, we would expect from the simple kinetic theory. And then the other thing that we would expect, and which is quite surprising, is that eta could be independent of the number density. Because this n over here and the n on the other side of the blackboard, they cancel out. That's kind of very surprising. Very surprising. It's so surprising that Maxwell himself actually went and uh, did experiments to test this because he didn't believe it. Yes, sir. Um, just so I make sure I understand. So this is all the limited weekly interacting systems? Is that I didn't say anything about that. I'm about to talk about the extreme interaction. I'm just talking about the. Um, we're going to pretend, for the sake of simplicity, that we can use kinetic theory. Yes, 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 so, so, so this is, we're just going to use this to, uh, to motivate uh, the formula. And we're, going to, we're not going to ask too many deep questions about how you would do this, 
beyond the kinetic theory of maximums, because that's, no, that's too hard. No, okay, so, excuse me. I'm going to question. If yes. there's a one-way R interaction, if, we, if there's a one-way R long-range interaction, the sigma will blow up, right? There is. There's also, also a qualification to this of that sort, yes. So, so don't worry about that for now, okay? So, so you're right. There's, there's all sorts of tricks you can play where the range of interactions goes like one over R to the fifth or something like this. There's, also, there's all those sorts of things that you learn on your mother's knee, but let's not worry about those for now. Let's just see, this, let's see how this idea works out. Okay, so here's something surprising. So, suppose you have a gas with no interactions, some ideal gas. No, no, no interactions in quotation marks, because now you're sufficiently sophisticated that you know that what I mean by no interactions is the interactions are very weak. So I still have interactions present that are very weak, so they don't really modify anything, but they do allow the system to come into thermal equilibrium. And in, that, in such a case, in this ideal gas, and what we say then is that the cross-section force is going to go to zero, and so that says that the viscosity goes to infinity. So in other words, the viscosity of an ideal gas is infinity. Now how many people here, if I asked you 10, minutes, 10 seconds ago, what is the viscosity of an ideal gas? Is it A or B? Are you right? Yeah, yeah. choice question. The viscosity of an ideal gas is A, zero, or B, infinity. To be honest, what would you guess? Zero. 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 Who would guess zero? Right. But it's not true, actually. It's actually infinity. So see, we get a strange, strange idea, strange conclusion, is that the, the stronger of the interactions, the smaller just the viscosity. Okay. So, if we're going to look for fluids that have very, uh, very small viscosity uh, and have the potential to have large Reynolds numbers, we should look for strongly interacting fluids, not for ideal fluids. So, now we want to uh, look at more dimension as ratio. Excuse me, but yes. if there is no cross section, how can there be any transfer of. There is no. Remember what I said? So there is no, no viscosity either. Remember what I said? I put quotation, quotation marks now. So I understand no interactions in the intermediate asymptotic side. But there, there is no vis the viscosity. Is, there, there is no transfer, diffusion of. Uh, no, if it's small but non zero, then it happens. The time scales are all very different. But, it, but, can, but this is true. As, as long as it's interacting with the walls, you'll still have momentum exchange between the walls. It's, interac if it's interacting with, with each other. We're not setting sigma equal zero. Oh, okay. I'm not saying sigma, sigma is still non zero, but non zero. So this is intermediate asymptotics. Just like we've been talking about all, all my three lectures. Okay. All right, so we will need, so I want to now quantify measures of viscosity. So how are, we, how are we going to do that? Well, you could say, well, uh, you could just look at the Reynolds number. So Reynolds number is U, L, the beta, O. So that's certainly one dimensionless measure. But that involves the actual uh, flow itself. It doesn't involve the, the properties of the material. So this, uh, so what we need is something more molecular, something more um, uh, intrinsic. to the, the material. <coughs> so let's ask them uh, something that I don't usually ask, which is let's go down and look at the molecular origins of these phenomenological uh, transport coefficients. So, so let's suppose we go and look at, for example, uh, the, uh, the uh, behavior of a fluid. So to a molecular level, 
description of a fluid. So we could use, for example, the uh, classical iron theory. And in the iron theory, you basically have a fluid looking like this on small, small scales. So you've got a bunch of particles bouncing into one another. And if you were to look at one of these particular particles, let's say this one, and ask how can it move around, what's going to happen is it's basically stuck inside some kind of cage. And then every now and then, a little, a little uh, vibration that causes the cage to open up and the particle can hop out. And so there's going to be some thermally activated motion of a particle as it hops from one side to another. And that's how, the, uh, how stress can diffuse uh, throughout, the, throughout the system. Yes, sir? So isn't this kind of a weird limit? Because we could have the mean free path pushed beyond the system size if we're taking the limit as sigma goes to zero. Yes, everything I'm going to tell you is weird. Okay? <laughs> But I mean, if you're if you're dealing with in such a rarefied regime where the mean free path is larger than your system size, there's no. Listen, I I, I have no way of going. So just just be patient, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're, 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 you're, you're, you're thinking ahead. All right. So let's have a look at what happens if you think about the the, uh, the hopping of a of a particle. So you go down and look at a Lyman theory, and what you find is that the viscosity has the following form. It looks like this. It's a Planck's constant times number density times some activation energy over KBT. So that's the, that's the form. And why do you get Planck's constant in here? So this is this is the real Planck's constant. And that's because if I want to ask what is the shortest time scale of the map. Then I can make a, I can make a, a, a time scale out of h over kbt. Remember that the dimensions of Planck's constant is joule seconds. So I can get a time scale from Planck's constant. So so that's uh, that's one way I can I can work out what the uh, viscosity is. And then you can see that, uh, to, that as I raise the temperature, uh, or as I lower the temperature, this thing is going to increase very dramatically. Okay. So that's that's one thing. Now, another way to look at the kinematic viscosity. Actually, what's the energy right there? An activate, some activation energy for getting over the, over the cage. If people do uh, uh, theory of liquids, uh, spend all the time trying to estimate what that is. And you can measure this and so on. So this is just an activation energy. OK. So now let's look at the, uh, the kinematic viscosity itself. So, so, nu, so nu is eta over rho, and in kinetic theory, so the rho is basically eta over the mass of particles times the number density. Uh, so, and I don't care about the mass particularly, so we, so we think about eta over n. So that's uh, one possible candidate. So you, you're thinking about eta over n as some measure of viscosity. Now, I don't want to just look at classical fluids. I want to look at relativistic fluids as well. And this measure is not a good one, because in relativistic fluids, particles are not conserved. So n has no meaning. There is no number density, because uh, there can be processes that create and destroy particles. So, so the problem with this is that in relativistic fluids, you can have a particle creation and destruction. And so uh, n uh, is not well defined. So what you have to ask then is, what is the analog of Reynolds number in a relativistic fluid? So you have to now go and work out the equations of relativistic hydrodynamics. And you'll be relieved to hear if I'm not going to do that. But I will tell you what the result is. So this isn't something that I can derive for you in a simple way. Probably somebody could do that, but I don't know how to do it. So, the, uh, so uh, for relativistic hydro, the, uh, the, the real uh, uh, analog of Reynolds number is, the, is a eta over the entropy 
density times the, uh, the temperature. So S equals entropy density. And uh, so in a, uh, in a sort of ideal gas, S would be something like N times uh, Boltzmann's constant, for example. And so what I would say is that eta over S is basically H N E over KDT, if you still use that kind of estimate, over N K B, or in other words, times constant over KB times E T E over K B T. Now, that's, that's one way to approach this, uh, this uh, idea. Uh, this is the, the ratio of the viscosity over the entropy density is some, is some fundamental measure of, of viscosity. We can ask, what is the possible limits on that function? So now I'm going to use the uncertainty principle to try to estimate the, the lower bound of the ratio of eta and x. Nigel? Yeah. Why would this rule never have a viscosity upstairs instead of the end? I really don't really, know. Yeah, I really don't really know. Okay, thank you. So, so thank you. So, um, so let's look about, let's consider the strong coupling limit. Remember that we saw that the stronger interactions, the smaller is the viscosity. So we should try to make the, the interactions as strong as possible. So what happens in the strong coupling limit is that the mean free path uh, becomes a very small. And then we can ask how small can it be? And the answer is, well, fundamentally, we should get to a point where delta P times uh, L is greater than or equal to our uh, Planck's constant, from just from the uncertainty principle. And so then, if you use that estimate, that would then say that eta over s is going to be some number of order h bar over 10 kb. And to get that number, what I did was I used the result for an ideal uh, closed gas, which most of you have done in uh, elementary east and mech, but s goes away from like 3.6 kb. So just, just, to, just to try to get some feel for what the answer is going to be. So another way we can approach this is we can also say, well, let's take uh, t goes to infinity in this formula here. So we take t goes to infinity here in the i formula, so that makes the viscosity as low as possible, and that also then gives us that eta over s, so the entropy density, is greater than or equal to h over k. So the idea is that then, for strongly interacting fluids, there should be a lower bound of order h over kb, and this is where string theory comes into it. So why does string theory come into this? Well, suppose I take a model of a strongly interacting quantum fluid. I have to study it using quantum mechanics, using quantum field theory, statistical mechanics. If I want to compute the viscosity, that's a linear response coefficient, so what I have to use is a Kubo formula to calculate it. So it becomes a problem in essentially many body theory and quantum field theory to compute a transport coefficient in a strongly interacting quantum system. And then if I and then if I want to do that, if it's strongly interacting, usually I can't do it. But in recent years, people have learned about something called the ADS CFT analogy, which says that there is, a, a, there is a, an analogy, a connection between strongly interacting systems and theories of gravity that they can be mapped into. So Darren Song and collaborators used the string theory methods to uh, argue that eta over s is in fact greater than or equal to h bar over 4 pi kb. So that's the idea. So let's have a look at the data. So let's see, is there any support for this idea that there is some the lower bound on the viscosity. So here I'm going to draw for you uh, the fluid, the uh, temperature, and uh, eta over S in units of H bar over Kb. Let's have a look at what we get. So 
the first fluid is uh, water, H2O, and I'm going to do this at uh, 1.1 times 10 to the 6 pascals. I should be, I should be in the pressure here. Let me do it like this. I let myself in space. So let me put in temperature in Kelvin, pressure in pascals. So here I have uh, 0.1 times 10 to the 6, temperature 370 degrees Kelvin, and then this uh, is And the ether over S turns out to be 8.2 in these units. If I take a, a helium 4, I'm going to have a pressure of 0.1 times 10 to the 6 pascals, uh, 2.0 degrees Kelvin. And this number is much lower, 1.9. If I take uh, water at, uh, at 2 times 10 to the 6 pascals, temperature 650, I get down to about 2. If I take uh, helium at uh, 0.2 times 10 to the 6, and now at 5.1 degrees Kelvin, I get down to 0.7. Now, if I take uh, the uh, cold atomic gas, uh, lithium 6, so now this is going to be at a pressure of 12 times 10 to the minus 9 pascals and a temperature of 23 times 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin, then this number is very small, but it's about 0.5, so that's one extreme state of matter. The last extreme state of matter I'll take is the quark gluon plasma at, uh, at uh, Brookhaven. And now the pressure is uh, 88 times 10 to the 33 pascals, and the temperature is 2 times 10 to the 12. And in this material, we've got down to something about 0.4. So the lithium in that case is a gas, is that this is a This is a cold atomic gas. Yeah. Again, sort of so, so, so what this shows you is that over a wide range of conditions, uh, one can create strongly interacting states of matter which have very low values of eta over s, possibly approaching this conjectured lower limit. Although whether this is a real lower limit or whether it's uh, can be violated as a subject of some controversy. It probably, probably is not an exact limit, but it gives you some idea. And these are the lowest values of of the uh, of of as a limit. So now I want to, to ask them to end now this part by asking if we have these systems with very low uh, viscosity, can they become solids? So, um, so about a year or so ago, two years or so ago, I went uh, to Fermilab, talked with uh, Greg Tini and uh, Rob Pizarski and, and others uh, about this question. So we tried to work out what happens in the logistic heavy iron plot. So this is two uh, and uh, <coughs> viscosity fluids, the turbulence. So, first thing I did was to project the relativistic heavy ion collider. And what they do with the relativistic heavy ion collider is something uh, interesting. They take a big lump of stuff, happens to be gold atoms, they fire them into one another like this, they crash into each other, and bits fly out. Okay? This is the high energy physicist's way of trying to figure out how something works. Just, just to smash it to pieces and look at the dead. And, um, and that's a picture of what happens, but it's not a correct picture. Because what happens is that these things actually get uh, relativistically contracted. So a better picture is to think of these, uh, uh, to think of these nucleons as being uh, pancakes like this, crashing into each other. And when they, when they crash in the middle, there's a big bag and there's a big lot of stuff that happens in there. All the uh, parts and gluons uh, forms a new state of matter uh, for a very short period of time. It's, it's uh, two-dimensional and arguably turbulent. So if we try to calculate what the Reynolds number is, 
And, and here's what we got. Um, this isn't published, but this is, the, this is about the number. The number is about Reynolds is about 100. And unfortunately, it decays in time. So very, initial, very early on, it's going to be high. Then what happens is once this thing is collided, this, uh, this pancake then stops to contract and the, uh, the turbulence is going to decrease. So this is probably half a minute. So maybe you can get up to 1,000 or something like that. Who knows? But it's not really going to be the same scale of turbulence that uh, I'll be talking about for the rest of the day. So that's the, that's the relativistic heavy ion collider. Now let me talk about the, uh, the second case I want to show you some nice of. Is it sensible to define the magnetic or something for that system? <coughs> yes. There's, there's a lot of things that have to be there's a lot of things that have to be discussed. And then it's, it's, a, it's a QCD method. So yeah, it's very complicated. So this so yes, there's a high probability that this estimate is wrong, but that's why I went and talked to the world's experts on the McCarthy and Plasma to try to, to do that estimate. So it's something like that. So, so certainly you'd be able to see interesting fluid mechanics phenomena if the if the state of matter stays around long enough for any of these things to actually take place. The second example that's uh, that uh, looks like a micro interesting one to look at is a graphene. So the graphene is, uh, you know what it is, it's single layer uh, carbon. And, uh, <coughs> and, and uh, this has been uh, hiding under a rock uh, for the last few years. Uh, you should know that uh, the electrons in graphene uh, obey a relativistic dispersion of it. That's really related to the symmetry of the of, 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 of the molecule. So, uh, so what that says is that uh, the Fermi velocity in this case is about uh, 300 for the speed of light, so it's about 10 to the 6 meters per second. And uh, the, the electrons are described not by the usual non-relativistic quantum mechanics, but by the by the Dirac equation. So we need to again use these sort of relativistic hydrodynamic estimates of what the Reynolds number is. So uh, what you get is that the Reynolds number is st over c squared, le over eta. And uh, what uh, you can estimate is that the characteristic velocity in the current is 10 to the fifth meters per second. And eta over s is about 0 0.2 h bar over kb. That's temperature equals 300 k. And so the, uh, I like the Reynolds number it was, a, it was a classical system. So you have uh, some effective mu. And what you get is that for L is about 5 microns, you get that the Reynolds number is about 100. So usually when you talk about electrons flowing through wires, electrons flowing through nanostructures, and so on, Nobody ever talks about that as being a hydrodynamic phenomenon. But clearly one should. And in fact, there are I have some, I have, uh, papers from the literature where people have actually tried to look at the postural flow of electrons moving through uh, a small microelectronic device. So, so that can happen. So now we have the possibility that at least uh, in graphene, one could make states of electron motion where Lens up 100 is not much by the standards of turbulence, but you'd be able to use things like vortex streams and so on. So there's a recent paper in Physical Affairs uh, by the Suchi and collaborators, where they've used relativistic lens Boltzmann in hydrodynamics to actually try to simulate what might be the flow states you'd be able to see uh, in graphene. So this is, a, this is an area that's very new, and uh, <coughs> you know, it's not something that people who do solid state physics and really spent much time thinking about, which is the hydrodynamics of the electron fluid. But I think that this is going to be an area in the future that is going to receive a lot of attention, and uh, whether or not it turns out to be uh, successful or not remains to be seen. Yes? Uh, is it only the case of graphene, or we can also think about other materials? It's, uh, it's, uh, as far as I know, it's only the case of graphene. So in graphene, you have a very, very low vulnerability. Um, so uh, that, that's why. So you can see, for example, quantum field effects in graphene. It's very hard to get materials as pure uh, as, as as graphene. So the silicon is very, you know, have to go to very low temperatures. 
in order to see a point of vortex and so on. So graphene really is the best candidate if you're going to see this kind of exotic turbulence in, uh, in solid state physics. Yes? But there can also be a more usual kind of turbulence in graphene, right? Graphene is also a two-dimensional crystal, so there can be de defects. And yes, there can be. Defects. Yes, so you can make defects, and then you could use the defects to look at uh, you know, how, uh, how vortices get spun off the defects and things like this. So nobody's yet done it. So it's, it's, it's something that's interesting. And who knows what, what people will find. I'm trying to persuade people to, to do that kind of experiment. There's other things that one might want to look at. One might want to look at the noise spectrum. One might want to look at um, whether or not there's an inverse cascade or an entropy cascade because it's two-dimensional to it. So there's many things that one could play around with. So I'm mentioning this to you just because you're here not just to learn, but you know, you're at the beginning of your research careers and you're looking for exciting problems. This might be one. Somebody else had a question about that. Yeah. Is the relativistic dispersion relation yes. the symmetry of the molecule? Yes, I'm not, going to, I'm, not going to go, I'm not going to go into that. So it's basically... And that's okay, yeah, but yeah. is it common? Um, you, um, it's not common. It can happen in degenerate gap semiconductors. So it, it, this was known... So graphene is not the first material where that has been known. So, um, so in fact, the, the, this feature of graphene was already worked out like 50 years ago. It wasn't something that was just discovered in the last few years. It was emphasized in the last few years, and people were observing this and so on. But it was also predicted when people started looking at the band structure of silicon or, or, or graphene uh, back in the, uh, in the 40s. OK, one other question, and then I'm going to go on to the uh, next part of my lecture. Uh, have people seen this vortices? No. No. Is there a way to... Uh... No. Nobody, nobody has seen this yet. This is all very, very, very new. But they have yeah. seen it in simulations? or? Yes. yes. You can simulate anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you see one of the projectors, uh, please? All right. I want to talk about um, another aspect of, of turbulence that, that uh, really follows from what I told you in the two lectures. And this is, a, this is basically from a seminar that I give these days, on, uh, which is called Friction Factor of Global Turbulence and Two Dimensions, where I'll see this with a So here's the thing I want you to uh, oh, let me just say. All this work I'm going to tell you about, this is all new, all recently published in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, with Colonel Briggs, Henry Kelly, Walt Goldberg, Gustav Joya, who are professors at uh, Illinois, Pittsburgh, and Bordeaux. I've been architect of Audi, uh, who is a uh, um, senior postdoc at the University of Illinois and about to take the faculty position. And Nick Guttenberg, now at a uh, postdoc at the University of Chicago. Tom Tran, who is now postdoc at the Death of Lusa, who you heard from uh, last week. And Carlo Zanella, who is a uh, grand student still at the North. Okay, so here's the, uh, here's the question. So you've got the impression from the last, uh, this last week, and probably from last week too, that turbulence really is the sort of frontier of classical physics, the last great unsolved problem of classical physics. And the question I want to ask now is, how will we know when we've solved the turbulence problem? What does it mean to solve the turbulence problem? So the uh, Clay Mathematics Institute has an answer to it. Okay, so the Clay Mathematics Institute says when in order to uh, uh, solve the turbulence problem, uh, if you solve it, you get uh, $1 million. And uh, they talk about waves follow our boat as we meander across a lake, and turbulent air currents follow our flight in the modern jet. So they talk about the sort of flow mechanics picture that, we, that we're used to. Uh, and then they go tell you what you need to do in order to claim the million dollars. And what you have to do is you have to prove the existence and smoothness of Mary Stokes solutions in R3 uh, and so on and so forth. All these pure math, uh, all these pure math theorems and so on. So none of that, none of these theorems has any real connection to the waves following our boat and the, and the turbulence in the airplane and so on and so forth. 
So that's one picture that people have. They're saying, if I could just prove existence and the uniqueness and smoothness of Navier Stokes, then I've solved turbulence. I don't agree at all. I think that if you're going to understand turbulence, you have to be able to do the following. Turbulence is about fluctuations at small scales. Everything I told you about yesterday was about things like the Commodore spectrum. We talked about the fluctuations. We tried to characterize the behavior of the constant. That's great. That's what physicists have to do. On the other hand, if you are a hydraulic engineer or you're designing an oil pipeline, you don't care about that. You just want to know how much drag is exerted by the fluid as it flows through the pipeline or through the channel. So you care about the macroscopic flow parameters. And I would argue that the way we understand things in physics, at least in condensed matter physics, is that we're able to make a connection between what happens on small scales and what happens on large scales. That's the job of statistical physics is to connect small-scale fluctuations with large-scale macroscopic properties. In equilibrium statistical physics, that translates into using statistical mechanics to look at the particles bouncing around in the box to then derive thermal dynamics. In systems that are out of equilibrium, like turbulence, what that means is looking at the small-scale fluctuations and then being able to deduce macroscopic properties such as drag. So my view is that if you really understand turbulence, it's not simply enough to be able to compute the Commodore spectrum or compute anomalous dimensions, intermittency corrections, or multi-factor scaling experiments. One has to find a way to connect the microscopic and the macroscopic. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next time, in the next rest of my talk. So here's another feature of turbulence. So I showed you, at the beginning of today's, uh, when we came in, I showed you a movie that, uh, that I made with Camille Kelly uh, uh, two weeks ago in the lab, looking at a flowing soap film, and you can see that you get these wonderful succession of edges and vortices and so on and so forth. And you can see that there's structure here on many scales, structure on large scales, structure of vortices down to small scales, just like we talked about yesterday. Now, if you were to ask the question, what is the drag exerted on a fluid? as it goes to a pipe. The answer is, you go look in Pratt or some textbook on flow mechanics, and uh, you worry about uh, the, uh, the boundary layer uh, structure, the, what's called the law of the wall, that tells you how the velocity as a function of distance from the wall increases as you go away from the wall. And uh, what Pratt uh, <coughs> uh, showed, he derived the formula for the, uh, the friction as a function of Reynolds number. And, uh, and uh, Bruno showed you that curve uh, like yesterday, and I'm going to show it to you again and talk you through it in a few minutes. Now, in Prandtl's theory, Prandtl's theory is simply a theory that assumes common sense asymptotics. It assumes intermediate asymptotics of the first kind, and from that you can very simply derive, and I'll show you in, 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 in a few minutes, that the velocity profile as you go away from the wall should go in more directly. Now, here's the thing this theory, the standard textbook theory, doesn't really make any explicit reference to the structure of turbulence at small scales. And so that says that the structure doesn't influence the velocity profile and it doesn't influence the friction factor. And the question is, is that really plausible? I'm going to show you that it's not. It's not plausible. And furthermore, that one can do experiments that are beyond the ability of the standard textbook theory of wall boundary turbulent shear flows to make predictions of. And, uh, we, and, and I'll show you that right now. So here's the situation. So yesterday we were talking about homogeneous isotopic turbulence. I didn't tell you what the flow was. I didn't say whether it was a pipe, whether it was a jet, or anything like that. We just assumed that it was homogeneous, isotopic, heavy on the boundary conditions. We didn't ask too many questions about those things. But as you saw from, uh, from Bruno's talk yesterday, Turbulence is fundamentally about instability, and symmetry is the enemy of instability. So if you want to understand turbulence, you don't want to look at the most symmetric situation. You want to look at the least symmetric situation. So you want to look at something like pipe flow. So in pipe flow, uh, you have uh, the following situation, you have a pipe with a radius r, and the real, real life has walls, and those walls are rough. So we have some roughness scale, one scale to equal r, the fluid flows through with some mean velocity v and exerts a shear stress on the wall, which we'll call tor. The Reynolds number is the usual Reynolds number, and the roughness ratio is the ratio of the roughness scale to the radius of the pipe. And the friction factor is, is what we really call the fudge factor. It's basically what you would get from fully developed turbulence would be squared, and, and then the actual uh, pressure drop across the pipe 
And so that's the, the, that's the real perfection of it. And what Nick Ramsey did was uh, he used uh, water, he made a variety of different pipes with different lengths uh, and different uh, widths. So he was able to vary by choosing the width and changing the type of sound value. He was able to vary the roughness ratio and he was able to vary the Reynolds number. And here's his sand grains that he glued to the side of the pipe. And uh, he was able to do that over uh, many orders of magnitude with Reynolds number and roughness. Okay, so here's what I'm going to show you uh, in, in the next few minutes. So first of all, I'm going to show you that uh, the multi-scale structure of turbulence that we talked about yesterday is indeed reminiscent of critical phenomena. But it's not simply enough just to look at the Commodore spectrum and just to look at parallel. One has to make a deeper connection between the critical phenomena and uh, what happens in the image. And that connection is something that is like a fluctuation in the dissipation theorem, and that I'm going to call it in this talk the uh, spectral connection. So in fact, uh, what, we're going to, what I'm going to show you is not only from the sort of statistical mechanical perspective is there a connection, but then can one make a kind of heuristic, somewhat hand-waving model uh, instantiation of that, look at how momentum is transferred into the flow, and actually derive an explicit formula that connects the friction factor of turbulence to the Kolmogorov spectrum, or to the energy spectrum. So the energy spectrum and the friction factor, the energy spectrum tells you about the small scale fluctuation. Friction factor tells you about the large scale drag. I'm going to show you an explicit formula that connects these two things. I'm going to show you how we tested that theory by looking at what happens in two dimensions. The two dimensions are special. As I showed you last uh, lecture, in two dimensions there are two types of cascade. Inverse cascade, with k to minus 5 thirds and energy, and entropy cascade, where it's a forward cascade and the spectrum going is k to the minus 3. So if I'm going to tell you that there's a connection between the friction factor and the energy spectrum, I have to be able to vary the energy spectrum, and the only way I know how to do that is to go into two dimensions where I have a choice of two different spectra. So I'm going to show you what those predictions are, and I'm going to show you experiments that we did uh, to actually confirm those predictions. And lastly, just in case I didn't get to see this again, because I've actually run out of time, chemical theory can't make these predictions. If I ask somebody what would you predict for what's going to happen in two dimensions, the friction factor, in two dimensions, chemical theory can't make that kind of prediction. And if it makes a prediction at all, it would be the same as the and that's clearly not the case. So clearly show that there is a spectral connection, there is a link between the energy spectrum and the friction factor. Okay, so. Let me tell you about critical phenomena. So this turbulence is a critical phenomena. So why would you think it is? Well, I showed you last time that there's these parallel uh, correlations in turbulence. And of course, it's famous that parallel correlations exist in critical phenomena. Both of these systems have strong fluctuations. Now, the critical phenomena problem has been solved. The turbulence problem hasn't. And so what I thought some years ago was, now, I'm going to solve turbulence. Why don't we try to repeat the pattern of discovery exemplified by critical phenomena but applied to turbulence? So let's remind ourselves how do we solve the problem of critical phenomena? So let's go backwards in time. So Ken Wilson got the Nobel Prize for it, so he presumably solved the problem. So what did Wilson do? Wilson wrote a paper in 1971, which was on cat, which was in, in, in the title Katanov's Block Spin Construction for, for Magnets. So he also did another paper on, on uh, in the quantum field here. Uh, and the fantastic, fantastic uh, invention of the realization group that really is the, is the start of the solution of the problem of phase transitions. Now, what Wilson did was extend Kazanov's work. What did Kazanov do? Kazanov invented this idea of block spins. Kazanov invented this idea that the effect of Hamiltonian of a system depends on the scale at which you look at it. He worked out in, in a sort of heuristic, phenomenological way how coupling constants vary with scale. And why was Kazanov doing that? Well, he was trying to explain data curves. He was trying to explain data that had been plotted by Ben Widom a few years earlier, and looking at the equation of state of fluids and eventually magnets, and seeing that these things collapse. And so that so looking at trying to explain the collapse led to the idea that we have to look at the Hamiltonian of the statistical mechanical system of different scales, and then from that came the idea of the normalization of flows, fixed points, and the whole explanation of critical experiments. So, can we do the same thing for turbulence? So I'm going to show you that one can. And I'm going to show you that one can do that 
with the nuclear energy data that we saw yesterday. So let's just remind you about what happens in numbers. So, so probably some of you have never had a critical phenomena course, so I'm going to show you critical phenomena in, 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 in just a few minutes. So here's the idea. If I take a magnet and observe the field, cool down the temperature, and eventually it becomes a critical point where the system spontaneously forms its own magnetization, and that magnetization increases from zero at TC to uh, its full value at zero temperature. And the way that we can describe that, a stylized fact, is to say that the magnetization goes as T minus TC to an exponent beta, and that exponent beta uh, tells you the shape of this singularity uh, right by the curve. The second stylized fact is the phase diagram, H as a function of temperature. And what this says is that as I go down in zero field, through this temperature, I have a second order phase transition, a continuous transition where the magnetization increases continuously from zero as I go down there. Another way of saying it is if I'm below TC, I'm over here, and I start off with a negative external magnetic field pointing down, and I change the magnetic field so it's pointing up, the magnetization over here is pointing down, the magnetization over here is pointing up, so on this pink line here, there is a discontinuity in the magnetization. There's a discontinuity in dF by dH, and therefore a first order transition. And you can ask what happens to that uh, to the magnetization as a function of external field somewhere in this plane. Well, the usual answer is this: if I take a magnet and I apply an external field, I orient some of the spins to be parallel to the field. So what you'd expect then is that the induced magnetization is proportional to the external applied magnetic field. That's another statement of linear responsibility. But strangely, at this critical point, right here, that linear responsibility breaks down. The magnetization is not proportional to H at TC. It goes as H to some power, which is conventionally denoted as 1 over little delta. So that's the breakdown of linear responsibility. Now, these two stylized facts follow from Widom's similarity framework. Widom said, look, if I write the magnetization as a function of the reduced temperature, T minus TC over TC, and external field H, then that follows the following form. Some T is the beta, and the same beta is here, and then a function of not two variables, but one variable, a composite variable H over T to some new exponent called the graph exponent delta. That's what he said, and I'll show you why he said that. So here's, what, here's his claim. And what I'm going to show you now is that if this is true, I can derive those two stylized facts I showed you before. The order parameter going up from zero and the breakdown of the linear response. So how do we do that? So what we do is we say the following. Let's, let's look at that scaling function, this fn, as a function of its argument equal z. If the argument is zero, then this should be a constant. Why? Because in zero external field, the magnetization gives us t to the beta, so this thing here has better be a constant. Better not be zero, better not be infinity, just a constant. If the correct behavior of the magnetization has zero field for t less than tc. Now, what happens for large values of the argument? How would I get large values of the argument? Well, the argument is h over t to the delta. To get large values, I would need to have h being non-zero and t tending towards zero. If h is non-zero and t tends towards zero, that means I go close to the critical point, this argument inevitably has to get large. If it's going to be large, what do we expect to happen? We expect to get the formula that m is going as magnetic field to the power 1 over delta. We expect to get the breakdown of linear response theory, but there's a problem. t is going to zero as we get close to the critical point. There's a t out in front and a t in here. The argument of this is going to infinity, the thing out in front is going to zero. It looks bad because the limit of something times something that's going to zero is going to be zero. <coughs> so what we need is that if we have non-zero h and t going to zero, somehow we need this t-dependent outside and inside here to cancel out. If that t-dependent cancels out, then maybe we can get m going as just some power of the external field. But it's easy to see how to do that. All we have to do is say that the scaling function z, as a function of its argument z, goes like z to the power of 1 over delta as the argument goes to infinity. If you plug that in to here, then what you can see is going to happen is I'm going to get t to the beta times h over t to the delta, all raised to the power little delta. 
And if I can get the T dependence to cancel out, if capital delta satisfies this formula, little beta minus capital delta over little delta is equal to zero. And so I get left with n is t to beta and a to the t to the beta delta. So this data class formula connects the scaling of the correlations with a thermodynamic to the critical. Because this is a thermodynamic property, these critical exponents here turn out to be related, I'm not going to show you this, related to the behavior of the correlation functions in the critical. Yes, John. So we've already solved for fm though in that final step, right? That should be. All I know now, all I know now is that fm has to have these absolute properties. So, so it'll be a constant times z to the one over delta. Say again. It'll be a constant times z to the one no, over delta. It's a function that has its argument goes to zero becomes a constant, and for large values of its argument tends to order this out on top. Okay. And what the function is is something that you can measure or calculate with the normalization. So how well does it work? So here's the magnetic field. I see it's magnetization as a function of temperature. It's ostensibly a function of external field and temperature, but what I'm going to do is plot it in the way that Witten's formula uh, describes. And if it does that, then you can see what's going to happen is that you're going to collapse into one universal curve. So basically think about this. Take m, divide it by t to the beta, and plot that against h over t to the beta delta. Then the curve that you get will just be f as a function of its argument. So that's what you do, and then and this is the result. These are real experimental data, these aren't computer simulations, and these are data for five different magnetic materials, uh, which are listed here. Uh, this is a universality, the thing is universality of critical phenomena, it doesn't matter what the material it is, as long as it's in the right universality class, everything quantitatively agrees completely, and you get data. Okay, so now I want to ask, what happens in turbulence? And I'm going to, so I'm going to skip this because I told you all of this yesterday. So I'm going to ask now, what is the analog of Widow's formula in turbulence? So think about this. Why should there be an analogy between critical phenomena and turbulence? Well, you know that the Commodore spectrum, E of k goes as k to the minus 5 frames. Well, that's kind of mean field theory kind of result. I described it yesterday as a kind of mean field theory. So let's ask what happens in a magnet. If you take a magnet near its critical point, the spin-spin correlation function, not the velocity-velocity correlation function, but the spin-spin correlation function, the magnetization correlation function, goes, it turns out, as k to the minus 2. It's a power law behavior. You get power laws uh, in, uh, in critical phenomena. And Greg like Eigen and I and many others have, uh, over the years, tried to write down uh, uh, relations, sort of dictionaries between turbulence and statistical mechanics. But that's not really good enough. Because what I just showed you is that in critical phenomena, it's not just that you get power laws, but you also get data counts. So think about it this way. Here's critical phenomena. Here's the uh, famous power law behavior of correlations. But here's the thing that people emphasize less which is the connection between the large-scale quantum dynamics and the correlations as embedded in this uh, formula here. So I want to ask the following question. In turbulence, I know what the analog is of the correlations, the power of scaling, that's just K41, for example. Now my question is, what goes in this box? What is the turbulence analog of this? Now, to do that, we need two scaling limits. So remember, over here, we didn't just sit exactly at the critical point with h equals zero and look at the power law scaling. We looked at the behavior in the field and temperature plane. We varied both external field and temperature. I had two variables to vary. So in turbulence, I also need two variables to vary. What should they be? Now, one variable is kind of obvious. One variable should be the Reynolds number. Because you saw yesterday that as I increase the Reynolds number, the range over which I see power law scaling increases. I should do an increase to the three quarters power. So we know that Reynolds number, as I increase Reynolds number, that's going to be like sending the temperature towards the critical point. But what's going to be the analog of the external magnetic field? The external magnetic field is a variable that couples to spins and orients them. So if I want something that does the, plays the same role in turbulence, I want a variable that takes a state of non-turbulence and helps create it, helps make it become turbulent. And the idea that, that we had was that the that boundary roughness can play that role. 
I have a smooth pipe. It's, uh, it's, it's stable, and I start making uh, roughness perturbations to it. It is going to spin off those things and then get stretched and create turbulence. So the idea is that we shouldn't ignore boundaries, a boundary roughness in the previous role on the external mechanism. Excuse me, Yeah. So how do you know there are only two relevant directions? I don't know. Huh? All, of the, all of this is, this is how you do science. You don't, you don't know the answer ahead of time, so, you, so I'm telling you the thought processes by which you try to, uh, or try to approach this problem. So, so find the simplest possible thing. Um, well, I, don't, I can't prove this to you, but you'll see in a minute that it works. Okay? So there could be many uh, relevant directions, and, 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 and probably there are, if uh, you have multifactor scaling. Uh, so if you look, you look at the paper uh, where I wrote with Ike in 1993, we discussed it. But for now, we're going to ignore that. We're just going to be as simple as we possibly can. Okay? So maybe that's not a. I, I can't tell you how many relevant directions there are, but we'll just, uh, we're going to try to do this as simple as possible. Okay, so here's Nicolaus' data. Friction factor, log of that, on the vertical axis, log of Reynolds number along the uh, horizontal axis. What he did, as you heard yesterday, was he looked at the case where you have uh, smooth pipes and you have rough pipes. When they're smooth, the friction factor is small. As you increase the roughness, the friction factor asymptotes to a larger and larger value. So the rough ones are over here, the small ones, the smooth ones are over here, and the range of roughness goes from 15 to 500. This machine here, as, as Bruno uh, told you yesterday, corresponds to the Stokes flow. Because uh, the friction factor is normalized by rho u squared, any friction that is proportional to the velocity is going to look like a 1 over Reynolds number on, on this graph. So that's indeed the, the uh, Lang uh, regime. Then you have the transition to turbulence, which we explained to you uh, yesterday, and we'll talk more about today or tomorrow. And then you have this regime here called the Blasius machine. And I want to say it more about it. So in Blasius, you can see that the friction factor seems to scale as a, as, a, as a straight line on this graph, and the slope is a quarter, so Reynolds to the minus a quarter. That's just an empirical fact, okay, for now. Moreover, as I make the pipes smoother and smoother, so I make the roughness smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, I go further and further down this Blasius regime. Okay, of course, as Bruno uh, said yesterday, you can never make something completely smooth, so eventually there's going to be some deviation from that. You get these deviations here, these, these, these barriers, and then ultimately, at, lo whoops, at large Reynolds numbers, the uh, friction factor becomes independent of the Reynolds number, but it only depends upon the roughness. And how does it depend upon the roughness? It depends upon it like, like this. The friction factor for large Reynolds number goes like roughness to the one third. And you can see that from, uh, from uh, this, uh, this, this plot made by Gustavo and Kaki, where they, where they plot the Nikaji data, and now they plot the asymptote as a function of the roughness, and you can see that the slope is to a good approximation of one third. And that's called the slope. So what we have now is two, uh, <coughs> two scaling limits. We have a temperature control and a field control in the magnetic case, and the analog of those turbulence is the Reynolds number going to infinity and the roughness going to zero, being the analog of the external field going to zero. Now we can do the same kind of scaling that Willow did on the magnetic systems, but we can do it now for the turbulent field. So the, uh, the stylized fact is that as the roughness goes to zero, in other words, the analog of the external field going to zero, the friction factor increasingly goes like Reynolds to the minus a quarter. So that's one fact. The second fact is that a large Reynolds number, meaning the temperature goes to zero, as it were, the friction factor is independent of roughness, and so the friction factor goes like roughness to the one third from Reynolds number going to infinity. So the goal then is can we combine these two stylized facts into one unified scaling form, just like we did with the And so we do that. We say friction factor goes as Reynolds to the minus a quarter times some function of the roughness times Reynolds to some exponent. We have alpha, I'm calling it alpha here. We call it capital delta in the case of the mechanics system. Now we determine alpha by the scaling algorithm. We want that a large Reynolds number, the Reynolds dependence here and the Reynolds dependence here, must cancel out a large Reynolds number in order to give the strictest scaling. 
And that says that G has to go as its argument to the one third for the large values of its argument, and this exponent alpha had better be three quarters. And that's the final condition for what it should be. So, does it work or doesn't it? So remember what we did with the magnetic system. We, we posited this so data collapse, we plotted the data in the way that the theory said, and we saw that all these different data with different magnetic materials all collapse into one universal curve. It doesn't work with turbulence. So here you are, here's Michelangelo's data, digitized and read off from the, uh, from the uh, tables that you can uh, download in this paper. And uh, here is the uh, raw data, and then here is the data collapse according to that formula. And you can see it's a reasonable data collapse, and the data even have overlapping regimes of validity, as you can see here in this modeling report. So it works pretty well, not perfectly, but pretty well. You can do better. Remember I showed you yesterday that there are intermittency corrections, small intermittency corrections to K41, because this is not really intermediate asymptotic of the first kind, there's really, there's really uh, intermittent asymptotic of the second kind. So a very far in the army uh, took my argument and then uh, added the anonymous uh, scaling exponents there and worked it through. And what you end up with is a formula which says that the friction factor is a scale like this. Here's this complicated formula here with the roughness and the Reynolds number of these exponents. What's important is that these exponents involve the intermittency exponent eta here, here, and here. If you set eta equal to zero, you get my formula, the nuclear formula. But if you have non zero eta, then this is the generalization. So now what you can do is say, all right, let's take the Nicolaidson data and let's plot it. And let's ask, what value of the intermittency exponent do I need to get in order to make my data collapse even better than it is? And the answer is, if you do that, here's the Nicolaidson data collapsed uh, as best you can do it. And the, intermittent, the value of eta is about 0.02, something that is consistent with the estimates that you get from the spectrum. So this is really absolutely fantastic. Think about this. Usually what you do is you don't put your finger up in the wind, you put a pole wire up, you measure the temperature fluctuations of the pole wire, that gives you the velocity fluctuations, you look at the uh, oil correlation function of the velocity fluctuations, you measure uh, power of scale in small wave numbers, uh, sorry, it's, it's small strength scales, and deduce the uh, kind of ball spectrum and try to find a very small correction. Very hard experiment to do. On the other hand, you can do something more simple. You just take a pipe, measure the pressure drop across it, and here's Nicolazzi who does that experiment in 1933, eight years before Komogorov even had the idea of the Komogorov uh, spectrum. And he had already, by measuring a macroscopic measurement, not a microscopic, but a spectrum, a macroscopic measurement, already determined in one of dimensions the terms of the second level. So that's really quite a lot. And then you can figure out, just when you can do the critical phenomena, you can determine the, uh, the anomalous uh, dimensions of the critical phenomena from looking at the large scale uh, thermodynamic scaling of the magnetization as a function of external field. Again, no correlation functions need to be measured. Not measuring large scale functions. Okay. So now I want to. Uh, I've got uh, 10 minutes left, and I don't want to go into uh, all the details. I want to now show you a few things. First of all, I want to show you uh, what would, uh, what does the Prandtl theory predict for uh, the experiments? And uh, can one predict the experiment by uh, some kind of physical argument? So I've shown you that the, the exponents in the friction factor, uh, we sort of simply used uh, values that came from common ball theory, but uh, what um, Gustavo Joya and Martin Chakraborty realized was that one can make a very appealing intuitive argument that it really calculates those experiments, and I'm going to show you that. So, first of all, here's the standard Prandtl theory, and this is again uh, very simple. It simply says the following If I know the uh, velocity profile, the velocity as a function of distance from the wall, then I can compute the mean velocity that is going through the pipe. And I can connect that to the friction factor by the formula that Bruno looked at yesterday. So I need to know how does the velocity as a function of y, distance from the wall, vary. And the argument is as follows. If I think about du by dy, it has to be a velocity scale over y. And the only velocity scale I can make is the, is, is the small stress divided by rho. y is equal to y. And then in principle it could depend upon another dimensional parameter, which is the Reynolds number. We're going to assume 
that this function of Reynolds number is just a constant. This is one of the assumptions of intermediate asymptotics of the first kind. Then this says that d by dy is just some constant over y, and so that means that u, the velocity, as a function of distance from the wall, there is as a logarithmic function of the distance from the wall. Now you go and integrate it up to get the friction factor, and what you find is the friction factor obeys this formula here, and that formula is plotted over here. And you can see that this formula is a monotonically decreasing uh, function. It doesn't have the values that you see in the real experimental case. What, uh, what uh, Gustavo and uh, Pilaki realized was that uh, you can do something rather different. You can say, let's suppose I have a wall, which is rough, and now I ask, what is the scale at which momentum gets transferred between the flow and the wall? Well, think about these sort of these little codes here. So fluid is flowing through here, and every now and then, fluid will fly out and enter into the flow. Like that. So you might ask, what is going to be the important scale for that? Well, if the, if the edges are very large scale, like this, much larger than these codes, they're not going to have much component of momentum in this direction. If the edges are very small ones, just tilling around inside there, they're also not going to be transferring much momentum. So the, the Goldilocks scale, the scale of edges, it's just about right, is the scale which is something of order the roughness, or if it's much bigger than the roughness, something of order the kind of scale. So that's my fundamental insight. And then what they did was they said, if I want to know the characteristic velocity at any given scale, let's call the scale S, then I can get that from the energy spectrum. So the energy spectrum is the rate of change of kinetic energy, the unit wave number I need. So I can integrate that up to get the characteristic velocity as the square root of the integral of the energy spectrum, up to that scale. So now you can go and put those two things together, and you can say that the friction factor should be the following. It's a stress. So there's a mean velocity flow out here. There's a flow of the edges inside this cove of a scale which is either r or the Kolmogorov scale. And then that says that the friction factor is rho v times us over rho v squared, and so it's just us over v. So what that says then is that our estimate of the friction factor is just, this, is just the velocity at the scale s determined by either the roughness or the common world scale in, in, in a way something like that. And so now you can put in for E of k the common world spectrum, k to the minus 5 thirds. And now you can integrate k to the minus 5 thirds and make the limit this, take the square root, and the formula that you get is an f goes as roughness plus some constants times Reynolds to the minus 3 quarters. Because remember the common world scale in the minus 3 quarters. And then this is all based on power one third, which comes from doing that integral. So what this then says is that at very large Reynolds numbers, the Kolmogorov scale is not very small. And the important scale for determining the momentum going into the flow is the roughness. So this term, this term goes, uh, goes away, this term becomes an important term, and you get roughness to one third. So you predict the of that. If on the other hand the fluid is turbulent, but the Reynolds number is small, then the Kolmogorov scale may be much larger than the scale of the roughness values. In that case, then, this term is negligible, this is the one that's important, and now you get F is Reynolds to three quarters to the power one third, so you get F goes as Reynolds to the minus a quarter. So you predict the Blazing So there's a lot more to be said about that, but I'm not going to go through it. So I don't have time. So now I want to talk in the last few minutes about what happens uh, in two dimensions. So what I'm going to tell you about is uh, we, we try to test this thing. But we try to test this thing in the following way. Since the friction factor supposedly depends upon the energy spectrum, I need a system where I can vary the energy spectrum. Two dimensions fits the bill. We have a two spectrum that we can make there. How do you make two dimensional turbulence? Well, what you do is you, you uh, guide the curve, as we talked about, to Rick, and uh, do a quark normal plasma, and the cost to build that is about $600 million, and that doesn't include the cost of running it or building the detectors or paying people to analyze the data. On the other hand, what you can do is you can uh, take some, uh, go down to Walmart, get some fishing wire, 
get some uh, a fairly liquid, uh, string the wire up in this way, and make a thin film of uh, soap bubbles. And then, once the soap film flow down, and the total cost of all that is about seven dollars and twenty-three cents. Okay. So now you take these soap films, and you can make a two-dimensional rough cut. Okay. So what we're going to do now is ask the following question: What does the theory predict? But what should happen to the friction factor in the two different cascades that I've shown you exist in two dimensions? The inverse cascade and the energy difference. Well, if you go to do the calculation, I'm not going to explain it to you. What you get is that if this exponent here, if we call that exponent alpha, then the friction factor goes as Reynolds to this power. So I can calculate it. I can calculate both the Glazier's exponent and the Strickler exponent for both cascades that I realize in two dimensions. And the answer is this. In entropy cascade, the friction factor goes as Reynolds to minus a half, and the stricter regime goes as roughness to the one half. In the inverse cascade, it's dimensionally the same thing as the energy cascade in three dimensions, so the results are going to be the same as one the current Okay, I'm going to skip the numerical simulations. Um, I'm going to show you experimental data. So here's the experiment. So uh, what you do is, uh, you, uh, in, in full generality, you have uh, rough walls, which we made eventually by getting uh, saw blades and using the roughness of saw blades to make our roughness elements. You take your soap film suspended from here, and the whole thing is encased in a kind of coffin to stop straight air currents from making the film flat back and forth like this. And then what you do is you put uh, little particles into the, into the soap film, and you do laser doppler law symmetry, you fire a laser beam at the system, you scatter the light from the laser, from the scattering of the laser light, you can measure the velocity of particles as they come within the, the laser spot, and so you can measure velocity time series, you can measure, measure uh, stress, you can measure velocity, you can measure power spectra, the energy spectrum, and you can measure the mean velocity as a function of distance from the wall. So that's how we interested in the system. And here's what you get. So here's the picture. This is a system with a smooth wall. So here's the fluid flowing down. Then we put a grid up here, just like the grid I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. And uh, you see this uh, lovely pattern of uh, vertices that come up. Here is the energy spectrum. And you can see here's E of K, this is the longitude of the energy spectrum. And you can see here that as best as one is able to do, one gets a slope K to the minus 3. So this tells you that what you're seeing here is the entropy cascade. Now what you do is you measure the velocity as a function of distance from the wall, and then you look at the gradient at the wall, and from the velocity gradient at the wall, you can work out the stress exerted at the wall. So you can measure the friction factor. And now what you do is you do this for as many Reynolds numbers as you can, and then you plot the result, friction factor, logarithm, versus Reynolds number, and here are the sets of the work that we've taken in Pittsburgh and Cordova for various systems. And what you see is that they all fall onto one parallel curve, and that parallel has a slope one half. So that's what we predict in the momentum transfer, one half. Not one quarter, but as you see in Nick Rouse's three dimensional time experiment. Okay, now we can make the inverse cascade. And this is work that's not been published yet. So, what we did, we, we played around for many months, and eventually what Twan uh, discovered was that if you put a cylinder in the flow and you have a rough wall, you can make a, uh, no, a no, no, uh, no grid, you can make a uh, turbulent missile flow that has an inverse cascade. And here it is. So this is the energy spectrum, in case the minus 5 thirds, as you can see. And we've also measured the third order structure function, so we can look at the direction of energy flow, and uh, basically, to cover the long story short, the energy is flowing upwards, as you'd expect from the energy cascade. So now we can go and measure the friction factor. Uh, actually, I don't have any of these data here, but here you can see what's happening. Now, in this experiment, the friction factor is varying the Reynolds number. Again, it falls on a curve, that's a parallel curve of our log, and the slope is one quarter. Not one half as it was when we had the energy cascade. So you can see that the friction factor is influenced by the type of turbulence that you have. It's influenced by the type of, uh, of uh, cascade process that you can So what I've shown you then is that uh, 
the uh, friction factor exponent it is it in the basis regime is a half in the entropy dominated flow, and it's a quarter in the inverse cascade flow. And, uh, and, and so these regimes have real significance. Okay, so here's the summary. So what I've shown you is that there's a kind of spectral connection that connects the small-scale fluctuations and the large-scale flow properties of terms. And this spectral connection is, is not present in any previous uh, attempts at looking at it. There's two different ways that one can see this. The first is that turbulence is a kind of critical point, a non-equilibrium critical point, of zero roughness and infinite memory. The fluctuations are related to large-scale flow properties in just the same way that you have these connections between the fluctuations and correlation functions and large-scale thermodynamics at critical points. And you get data collapse uh, as predicted uh, uh, in critical phenomena. You also get those in turbulence. Well, what I didn't show you was simulation data, which also shows that data. The second aspect of the spectral connection is using simple, heuristic, almost surely improvable, we you know they have to be improved calculations, uh, to relate explicitly the energy spectrum to the friction factor. And we've calculated these exponents in two dimensions and three dimensions. And they agree with uh, the experimental data from the Garazzi, and they agree with the experiments uh, that we were able to do in, uh, in two dimensions. I'm going to finish. Yeah, yeah this, is it. this is it. So, what about the million dollar uh, prize? So, remember that you've had two lectures now from me about turbulence. And virtually everything I told you, none of it came from the Nagus Stokes equation. And if you want to understand turbulence, Nagus Stokes equations are arguably the worst place to start. <laughs> okay? Just like if you wanted to solve the problem of critical phenomena, you really wouldn't want to start from the band structure of mind. You'd start from the land Ginsburg theory or a magnet or something like this. Second thing is, we can understand turbulence, we can make lots of physical understanding of turbulence without having to prove any of the theorems that the claims that he requires. Because as I told you yesterday, when you prove theorems about an equation, those theorems don't have a way of saying, yes, it's turbulence, no, it's not turbulence. And if you did prove all those theorems, I don't think that they would shed any light on the connection between the microscopic fluctuations and the macroscopic uh, properties of the spectrum. So I'm done. If you want to read about the recent work, uh, here's, here's a whole bunch of things. This might be stupid, but. The friction no, there's no such thing as a stupid question. At least stupid answers. <laughs> the friction factor versus the Reynolds number curve looks very much like a first order transition curve. Like this, right? So the, it seems there's a kind of hysteresis somewhere. Are you asking about the friction factor as a function of the Reynolds number? Yes. It, 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 has a it, 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 it does have a transition, but that's the transition that Bruno talked about yesterday, the transition to turbulence. Right? So, but is there a hysteresis yeah. there? This, 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 yeah. This, so Bruno's talk was all about this area here. Yeah, but is there a hysteresis somewhere there? Because there are three... Is there, is there what? Hysteresis. Is there hysteresis? Here. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so this transition is very, very complicated. I'm not saying anything about that. There, 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 are, there are universal statements. I believe one can make very close to the transition, which we will probably talk about later on today, until tomorrow. Uh, but, but basically, it will be just this is more sort of But explain that we see a difference, I mean, what justifies the difference between the normal cascade that goes to the small level and the inverse cascade? Well, why it, that it, why seems, it? it seems that the boundary condition actually made it so that we see one or the other. Yes, I mean, why do, we, why, why do we see one in one flow situation and one in another? The, 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 question, the, the question, atmospheric flows, it, yes. we actually see both at the same time. Yes, and, and, we, and we can in our system too. The, uh, the, the important question you have to ask is what is the scale of injection? And what is the mechanism by which the turbulence uh, uh, penetrates into the body of the flow? And we don't have a very good understanding of those things. So we just uh, tried things in the computer simulations 
And then what we did in the computer simulations turned out to be a good guide for what to do in the actual experiments. And I don't have a detailed understanding of, of how that happens. Okay, so that's an area of turbulence. Well, I mean, we were saying that there is a Hamiltonian dynamics of these yes, yes, yes. So I think that if we have big eddies, if the, di the dynamic should predict the same, I mean, should predict the same behavior all the time, right? Should they should decay to smaller eddies and not build up no, to bigger eddies? No, or what happens in, oh. it's in the inverse cascade, so in, in the notes, there's a little bit of heuristic explanation and some exercises if you want to work through. What happens is, in some sense, the eddies merge together because the angular momentum moves. And so think about the big red spot of Jupiter. Okay, that's a two-dimensional flow. The energy can emerge to form one big giant vortex. So that's the way that the energy can go up, upscale. And then ultimately it gets dissipated because the big vortex rolls up into the walls of the system. And so the actual dissipation that ends up occurring at the boundaries. That's the risk of it. So, so it's a vortex merging mechanism. It, so you have to look, it's very it's dimension dependent. On the British part, is that uh, viscosity defined also for a pure superfluid, which has no kinematic viscosity and no energy? Yes. Yeah. So real, real superfluids do have viscosity. Pure superfluid? Sorry. Yeah. Pure superfluid has a viscosity. Okay. It, it's, just that it, it, it's just that in a certain situation, it doesn't appear to create some drag. But it, it doesn't create the drag through the, through, through the mechanism of down bears to Michael Preller explain to you about D'Alembert's paradox? It's in, his, it's in his notes. Okay, so if you take any kind of uh, perfect fluid, so curl V is equal to zero, and then you work out what the, uh, the force exerted is by, by a profile, a lambda profile, is just zero just because of the, the jump through the, through the, uh, through the existing through the, through the curl fluid. So, so superfluid does have a, a viscosity. In particular, if you take, put your fingers into a superfluid and stir it up, you'll create lots of these kind of vortex lines, and you will have a viscosity that you can measure. So, so Dan and his system, there's definitely a, a viscosity of superfluid. It's in this one over here, this, 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 two, this two is below the superfluid. No, no, but I mean zero, zero temperature. Where Even zero temperature. But, but, if, if you move it, if you try to move it, you, you'll, remember, when you talk about superfluid viscosity, you're always assuming the flow is lambda. Mm -hmm. But as you go down, it stops being lambda. Okay. You can create quantum vortex lines. Okay. okay. Uh, well, I guess copyright then. And copyright.